our final presentation uh, is mostly by me. Uh, it's called Preparing Teachers to Design Project-Based Language Learning Experiences. And it's called that because today's symposium represents the first step in uh, a three-stage process for you to engage in professional learning around the topic of project-based language learning. I saw a lot of curiosity uh, among the audience members during our previous presentations, and you can satisfy that curiosity by joining us on a professional learning journey into project-based language learning. This series is offered by the National Foreign Language Resource Center. Down at the lower left, you can see the red circle around NFLRC. We are one of 16 federally funded centers that are called language resource centers, funded by grants from the Department of Education. Uh, this is the fourth year of our grant cycle, and so we do have, uh, we feel we have amassed some useful resources for you in the area of project-based language learning. So uh, in today's presentation, you're going to find out what is the framework and the time frame for our National Foreign Language Resource Center project-based language learning professional learning experiences. Uh, I'm using professional learning deliberately because, uh, as I understand, there's uh, a movement lately to move away from the word professional development. All right, um, so I'm also going to recap the symposium topics that we have seen so far and to give you a preview of what's, what's next for you, uh, and that would be our online institute. This year's special focus in our professional learning events is pragmatics and project-based language learning. All right, so why are we doing this? Essentially, we need a framework for applying project-based learning in language education contexts. So in a phrase, we want to go from project-based learning to project-based language learning. We need tools and models to support the implementation of PBL principles in our second or world language learning domain. And we want to establish a baseline of project-based language learning practice through this series of professional development events. So what, what is our starting point? We have a wealth of resources for uh, framing our curricula and our teaching practices in world languages. We have the national standards from ACTFL. We have the 21st century skills map. We have uh, performance assessments. We have task-based instruction, content-based instruction, and we have models for intercultural collaboration. We can bring all of these things into play uh, in our practice in project-based language learning. Now, we these tools are all part of our world language universe, and we in the past haven't been used to thinking about project-based learning, but meanwhile, especially in the K-12 universe, project-based learning has been enjoying uh, quite a, a period of growth. And the single institution that uh, offers the most professional development resources for project-based learning is the Buck Institute for Education. You heard Bob Lenz, who is the executive director, uh, present the basic concept of project-based learning to you during our first session. Uh, and he talked about high quality uh, project-based learning. What you see here in this camera lens icon uh, is called the gold standard of project-based learning. Now, I think Bob already mentioned that the high quality standards that he was showing to us are actually a preview and they haven't been published yet. What you're seeing here in the camera lens is the current existing standard for project-based learning and it's called the gold standard. Uh, so uh, what this camera lens is suggesting is that in every designed project, you should have these essential elements in the design of the project. So these are the things that you would be learning more about if you participate in our professional learning events. So how does this work? We started this whole process in 2015. We held our online institute uh, for several months starting in January, and then we followed it up with a summer institute. And we've been doing the same thing in subsequent years. The model is that uh, you, this year, um, for example, uh, 
right now we're at the symposium in January. So having participated in the symposium, you may be interested in moving on to the online institute, which begins on January 31st. Uh, if you participate in the online institute and you complete all the tasks that we ask you to do, then you will receive an electronic badge that shows that you uh, have that level of achievement. And if you earn that badge, uh, by a certain date, then you will be eligible to apply for our Summer Institute, which is residential in Hawaii. So um, you may have heard uh, Chantal talk about participating in the Online Institute and developing a project blueprint. She said it was 30 some pages long. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe that might uh, frighten some people off. Well. Uh, now we're revising our model so that you won't be developing one project design in depth. Rather, during the online institute, you'll will be generating a series of ideas for projects and then refining them with a special eye to uh, pragmatics. Okay, um, before we get into that uh, professional development series calendar and so forth, I'm going to re recap what we heard uh, yesterday and today. Our first presentation was by Bob Lentz, the executive director of the Buck Institute for Education, and he helped us understand, get a basic grasp of what project-based learning is, particularly in the K-12 concept. Uh, and some important concepts were that they start a project with the end product in clear view, so it's uh, sort of a backward design. Uh, that a project has benchmarks for assessment along the way, such as when the kids started their planning on paper in two dimensions and later they moved on to building three three-dimensional models of their houses. And finally, they developed a full presentation for their client of how, how their house uh, would be. Uh, and also he mentioned high quality project-based learning standards. Um, the current standard is the gold standard, but as Bob mentioned, that's going to change to the high quality PBL standards soon. Our second presentation was from Chantal Esquivias Arguelaguet and uh, Lucia Rubio from Utah. And they told us about the mural design project for a new business in Kearns, Utah. Their project was featured in the language educator issue from October, November. Learners investigated the background of this uh, controversy surrounding a previous mural project, how uh, the community attitudes uh, brought that to pass, what the laws and regulations are on public art, and then they produced new designs for an artist to produce a new mural. And they had a strong integration of 21st century skills, including uh, the use of technology and collaborative work in groups. Today, we heard from Barbara Bird, College of Southern Nevada, gaming the curriculum, creating board games for local Italian speakers. And she told us about a board game that her students created for Casa Italiana, a local Italian cultural organization. Uh, it was an experimental short term project that even a teacher who is not going over to PBLL entirely could fit into another curriculum and the learners investigated regional culture and authenticity through a process of sustained inquiry in which they created this board game. All right, so what do we have coming up this year? Uh, right now, we are in this online symposium, Envisioning Project-Based Language Learning. And uh, when we finish today, then the next event will be the beginning of our online institute, Fundamentals of Project-Based Language Learning. This consists of five weekly webinars, much in the same format that we're doing now. Uh, that begins on January 31st. Uh, now, there are two different ways of participating in the online institute. Either you can attend the sessions live much as you're doing now uh, and uh, work through with the rest of the cohort uh, basically at the same pace or you can choose to complete the online institute on a self-paced basis 
if you choose that option, then what you'll be doing is not participating in the live webinars, but watching recordings of the webinars after the fact, and then completing the tasks on a time staggered basis. The focus for the online institute this year is on project-based language learning and pragmatics. So uh, pragmatics is the contextualized use of language, language as a social act. And of course, you would learn much more about that as we go along. Once the online institute is completed, uh, the cohort who chooses to complete it uh, together in you know, sort of real time attending the webinars live will be able to complete the tasks in the online institute in good time uh, to receive a badge that will qualify them to apply for the summer institute. Those people who choose to complete the online institute on a self-paced self basis uh, might be a little bit later in time and so they might miss the deadline for completing the badge and qualifying for the Summer Institute. So if you think you might like to come to the Summer Institute, we recommend that you participate in the Online Institute as part of the live cohort rather than on a self-paced basis. So that uh, Intensive Summer Institute is a little bit earlier this year than it has been in past years. The dates are June 13 through 20. So that is a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then you have a weekend, and then the following Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And all of this is uh, in residence in Honolulu on the University of Hawaii campus. Uh, as far as costs go, there's a $25 fee for participating in the five weekly webinars, the, the online institute. Uh, whether you are part of the live cohort or you choose self-paced, the cost is the same, $25 total. And the cost for the Summer Institute uh, is, that involves uh, greater expense. Um, there's a $125 registration fee, but then of course you have to consider your travel expenses and your lodging expenses in Hawaii. For some participants, we will be able to partially defray the costs with a stipend for travel, but that would not cover the entire cost. We'll have more information on exactly how you register for these things available to you uh, soon. Okay, so the, how does the online institute work? Well, we always uh, lay it out as five uh, sessions, uh, but the, the topics vary a little bit from year to year. This year, uh, these are our topics. Uh, in the first session, we'll be talking about from project-based learning to project-based language learning. What are the special considerations that come into play when you're trying to apply the PBL model to world language teaching and learning? In uh, the second session, it will be designing engaging projects. The third session is pragmatics and project-based language learning. The fourth session is scaffolding the learning experience. And we just learned in Barbara's session what scaffolding means, that is providing support for students, whether it's their language use or the process of the, of the project. Uh, and the fifth session is about assessing learning and your project's impact. All right, so um, these are the dates begins on January 31st, and then it's weekly through February 28th. Uh, the format of uh, the Online Institute is you, are, you would be whitelisted on a, a web page. In other words, you would visit the web page, and uh, as long as you are logged into the uh, Gmail account that you provide to us, then you will be on a whitelist, and the site will allow you in based on your login to that email account. And in the, uh, in the Online Institute webpage, you can view a video of the webinar uh, that has taken place. And then you can uh, uh, test yourself with a few simple questions about the content from uh, that footage and then you will move on to a page called More to Consider. 
more to consider gives you a little bit more text-based information on the topic that was addressed in the webinar and gives you some links to explore on that topic. Then you'll get involved by participating in a discussion. So get involved is basically a discussion forum on whatever the theme of that week is and you're expected to participate in that discussion by reading the postings that have been made and giving your own response. Finally, you'll be asked to think about how you would apply the principles uh, that are covered in that week to project design, and you would have some homework, such as generating a project idea or refining a project idea. So that's how it works. We have five modules. In each module, that is each webinar session, there are three lessons. So this time in the symposium, each day you had two uh, presentations but in the online institute you would have three uh, so in total there are 15 lessons uh, there are five 90 minute webinars that is 30 minutes per each lesson and uh, we have a staggered timetable such that there's one cohort of people who are in who are uh, going through together that's called the facilitated cohort and then uh, other people who are coming along and f following uh, by viewing the recorded material. That's called self-paced. All right. Uh, I already uh, talked just now about the lesson structure. That is, you watch an intro video, you take a little quiz based on that, you uh, read a little bit more about the topic, you participate in a discussion, and then you apply the knowledge. Um, I notice I forgot to edit this slide. We are not asking you to do a full project blueprint this year. Rather, it will be separate, smaller assignments, such as generating project ideas. This lesson structure is loosely based on the TED-Ed lesson model. Uh, TED-Ed is a website that allows uh, content creators to take videos and create lessons out of them. So we applied their lesson structure. Uh, all right, so you, here's the flow of activities that you would take part in. You would view the topics on our dedicated website. You would either participate in the live webinar or you would view the archive video from the webinar. You would read in more detail. You would participate in the discussion. You would work on the design tasks and finally, we would ask you to do a final written reflection on your learning. And as long as you uh, meet our criteria for having uh, completed those uh, tasks to satisfaction, then we would issue you with an electronic badge. Uh, what is an electronic badge? Uh, it's basically a, a graphic, a computer graphic that is linked to a set of criteria and it represents a certification by us that you have accomplished uh, tasks that show that you have mastered uh, theoretical and practical aspects of designing projects for the context of world language teaching and learning. So there's a specific set of criteria for earning the badge, and this year's criteria are as follows. I realize this slide is a little bit dense. I'm going to read through it. So number one criterion is that you learned about fundamental aspects of project-based language learning and some of the commonalities and differences between project-based learning and project-based language learning by completing a series of online modules and that you have completed and submitted the following deliverables. You're going to generate three project ideas following module one. You're going to uh, generate three initial product squares as part of module two. You may remember the product square that you saw uh, during Chantal's presentation. You'll be working on those yourself. Then you will submit three revised project product squares with added student learning outcomes and pragmatic elements. You will submit a plan for scaffolding student skills in the interpretive mode for one selected high quality authentic text and you will submit a self-evaluative composition reflecting on the strengths and the weaknesses of the product square that you have generated 
And finally, you will give us a rubric for assessing student products in one of your chosen projects with three to five essential dimensions, that is criteria in the rubric. And the third uh, criterion is that you participate in a collegial discussion on topics related to language learning, project planning, design, and implementation by posting responses to prompts related to project-based language learning in the majority of the Get Involved sections of the lessons. So you have to do at least eight of the Get Involved sections in the lessons. All right, uh, I'm going to hand over the audio to Marta gonzalez Lloret, who is one of the leaders of our, uh, uh, our Summer Institute this year, and uh, is going to tell you a little bit about this year's special focus, pragmatics. So uh, go ahead, Marta. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? All right. So we wanted to focus the um, seminar this time in pragmatics in uh, project-based language learning, because pragmatics is really a piece of information in language that we hardly ever attend to, and it's of immense importance. If you think on how to greet someone, the first thing that may come to your mind is actually just the handshake, right? However, we know that people greet each other in many different ways. And the way that people greet each other says a lot about how someone is, how someone, uh, the perspective of that someone towards the person that is receiving the greeting. And this is something that in second language learning is hardly ever included and it's of great importance. If you look at the two last pictures, the uh, Angela Merkel greetings of Bush and Trump, you can tell the difference between how those people feel uh, towards each other, what they are meaning in the way they're greeting. And uh, our students need to learn to how to observe how people um, not just greet, but behave towards each other and what that means and how they can apply the way that people behave with each other. So pragmatics is all about how people use the language in context. So um, can you take a look at this, this email? It's a very short email. This is an, e in, an email from an advanced English uh, L2 student. I'll give you three seconds to read it. Okay, so this email seems quite fluent, right? It's, it's, uh, it gets to the point, right? Hi, I need an appointment to look at my composition. I can come tomorrow at 10.30 between my classes. Is that okay, Jennifer? Okay, in something like that, we could say, is it fluent? Yes, it is quite fluent, right? But is it really accurate? That is, can we actually see what's um, going on there, right? What's the greeting? I mean, what's the address even before that, right? Hula Girl XX. Who is Hula Girl XX, right? Jennifer, a teacher with, um, with her Barbara, but probably six classes of five, five or 10 students each. Who is Jennifer? There's probably like 20 Jennifers in, in, in your classes, right? So how we greet people, even in an email, right? how um, the level of formality that that email has, the level of um, what it says, right? How it says it. And uh, all of that is extremely important for the language. So is it fluent? Yes. Is it accurate? Mm, not so much. Is it appropriate? Definitely not, right? But usually a student should not be telling a teacher when that appointment is going to happen and given for granted that the teacher is going to be there if it is not office hours, et cetera, et cetera. So what is pragmatics then? Quite easy to see, right? Pragmatics is the area of language concerned with what to say to whom, in what circumstances, and how to say it. This is, this is extremely important. Native speakers do these at different levels, but they have to learn how to do this. Parents school kids all the time about say thank you, right? Say please. All of these things, uh, kids get socialized into it. They're not, they don't come intuitively with language. 
And in a second language is something that students need to learn also. And they need to learn it because not always the L1 and the L2 will transfer perfectly from one to, to the other. Most of the times they don't actually. So we need to know what the differences are between the way they behave, people behave in their L1 and in the one that we are learning now, our target language. So for the L2 um, students, um, for the L2 language, the students need to acquire that ability to use the language effectively, appropriately. And this is extremely imp important if they want to achieve a certain purpose, if they want to understand what other people are do, and if we want to avoid stereotypes. So in PBLL, um, usually we don't think about pragmatics, right? We think about language, but we think about vocabulary, we think about grammar structures, but where is the pragmatics of the language? Pragmatics are always intertwined with all of the other parts of the language, but they're not so obvious that they don't need to be taught explicitly. So learners need to, to, need to learn how to do and say things in an appropriate way. So through project design, we could actually implement these L2 pragmatics, address them explicitly, practice them like any other language skill and incorporate them into interesting projects that will accomplish what uh, PBL does. So for example, as part of a project which um, is quite often, which quite often includes interviewing a member of a community to find out how to do anything. In this case, as an example, to celebrate a traditional holiday. We, of course, want the students to know the content, right? What about the holiday, when the holiday is celebrated, everything that is necessary for the students to ask those questions in an interview. For the language, the students will learn the linguistic forms associated with that task of asking questions, of doing an interview. So we may require present tense or past tense, how to form questions, the vocabulary related to that content, and also, of course, pronunciation, intonation, comprehension, etc. As for the 21st um, century skills, the students would need to do things such as use a phone or a tape recorder, get the data, transcribe the data. And then here comes the pragmatics. We could stop there, and that is what most of the projects look like, but we could actually uh, talk a lot about how we actually engage with those actions. In this case, uh, uh, first, asking a person for an interview, how to make a request for an interview. It's not the same to make a request from a classmate than to do a request from a member of a, an older member of a community. In different cultures, that would look quite different also. How we introduce ourselves. It's not the same to introduce ourselves to someone that is known to us, that someone that we have never met before. Again, the politeness levels may be very different in different cultures. And then how we produce appropriate greetings, how we ask questions how we manage the topics, who initiates the questions, how do we follow up questions, how do we do thanks? That looks very different in different cultures also, different L2s. And we need to know the turn-taking practices of an interview, when to overlap, when not to overlap, how much time do we do between turns? That looks very different in languages. For those of you that are Spanish speakers out there, you know that that silence between turns in a Spanish conversation are really short. People overlap all the time and talk all together. That is very different in English, for example. So students need to be aware that these uh, are uh, existing parts of the, of the interlanguage pragmatics of a culture. And of course, they need to see the difference between their L1s, L2s, their C1s, culture one and culture two, in order to understand these parts of the language. So they seem like a small things, but they're not really small things. You can think that just jumping over someone's turn will be seen very, very fast as rude. And that can very, very easily 
finish that interview, finish that conversation. So those interactional practices are actually essential for uh, a good project to have a good ending. So in this, uh, in both the um, online institute and the summer institute, we will be emphasizing how when you create projects, we can actually put things that will benefit the students from knowing pragmatics into your projects. Thank you very much, Marta. And apologies to everyone for the jumping screen. It was hard for me to manage my microphone and the slides at the same time. Uh, as is said in Hawaiian, makahana kaike, the knowing is in the doing, and that is going to be our emphasis as we proceed through our professional development series. Now, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn on my camera uh, and uh, address some of the questions that have uh, come up in, uh, in the chat as we've moved forward. Okay. All right, so um, I see that uh, Jim Yoshioka, who is the coordinator of the National Foreign Language Resource Center, has posted quite a bit of information in the chat about uh, how you can access these professional learning events. Uh, so the dates and times for the online institute, he has posted as a link to uh, NFLRC hawaii.edu slash events slash view slash 109. Please do follow that link and bookmark it. As we go forward, that page will change. You'll be able to, at the appropriate time, uh, register for the online institute. Uh, some people are asking about uh, professional credits, uh, CEU points, for example, for participating. Uh, in the United States, there is no single standard for teachers to receive uh, continuing education credits for their uh, professional needs. The badge is based on that set of criteria that I took you through. So it's, this is a matter of referring your supervisor or the appropriate authority uh, to those criteria. Uh, we, are, we don't represent any school district or uh, you know, credit granting authority, um, but the badge does represent a certification by us that you have completed that skill set. Um, we are happy to communicate with those supervisors and explain to them uh, what the criteria represent. So uh, our answer to can we obtain CEUs is put us in touch with uh, the person who grants those CEUs and we can discuss that with them. Uh, there's a question about watching the self-based videos for review after participating in the facilitated session. So let's say that you're a member of the facilitated group, that is the group that's attending the webinars live. The question is, can you also view the videos of the sessions afterwards? The answer is definitely yes. Those videos are available to both cohorts. Um, however, um, when we conduct the live session, we're recording the video live and it takes us about two days to get that video edited and ready. Um, we endeavor to have it ready by the weekend so that you can review and, and do the tasks uh, after we've finished in the middle of the week. Uh, okay, there's another question. Uh, you mentioned that we should participate in the facilitated cohort rather than the self-paced. This person is interested in the Summer Institute but has classes during the time of the Online Institute. Is it still possible to participate in the Summer Institute if I choose the self-paced version? The answer is yes. Uh, it's simply a question of whether you can earn your badge in time for the application process for the Summer Institute. So let's say that the facilitated cohort is going on uh, and you are following along the facilitated cohort uh, at a very close pace. In other words, Wednesday we have our live session, then the video gets posted about two days after that. You could jump right in as a self-paced participant and do that work uh, at that time, almost in, uh, 
exact pace. Um, the deadline for completing all the requirements and uh, for your badge is March 31st. Um, the final session of the live facilitated cohort is February 28th. So there's basically one month between the end of the live facilitated cohort sessions and the deadline for uh, completing all the assignments, um, which is definitely achievable. Uh, what time does the facilitated group start and how long does it take? So each facilitated session is 90 minutes long, much like these sessions uh, yesterday and today, and it starts at the same time. That is 10 a.m. Hawaii time. Uh, so um, the dates, as I mentioned, are beginning on January 31st and then every week through February 28th. That's the facilitated cohort time. Um, aside from the 90 minutes that you spend uh, in the live sessions, uh, I can't venture to guess exactly how long the homework would take, but I would think uh, a reasonable figure would be about two hours a week. Uh, certainly, I don't think any more than that to complete all the tasks. Uh, there's another question, is this the last year of this project? Are we planning on having another series of institutes next year? And what would be the topic? Uh, and uh, there's a related question, which is, can we do the online institute in 2018 and then a summer institute in 2019? I'm afraid I don't know the answer to these questions. Um, I think there's a definite possibility that we will be continuing this professional development series because uh, it's, it's been successful and we want to build on our successes. Uh, I'd like to hand over to our director, uh, Julio Rodriguez, who is the head of the National Foreign Language Resource Center, to comment on this question. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry that I'm interrupting a little bit here, but uh, I just wanted to add that um, this is our last year of the grant. Uh, as you, some of you may know, we are an LRC, a language resource center, which uh, means that we're basically on a four-year cycle. So this is our last year uh, on the grant, and well, we don't have uh, much information about uh, future prospects as to how the centers will continue after this. So realistically, we can only promise 2018 as one more year of activities, and this year we would be uh, submitting another proposal to continue the center for four more years. So because of that uncertainty, we're not able to actually promise anything beyond 2018. But uh, by all means, we if we are refunded, we will keep working on project-based learning because we think that it's an area in the profession that still needs a lot of attention and it still offers a lot of potential. So I hope that that clarifies the question. Thank you very much, Julio.